Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Continuing in our journey of reflecting on the, the joy, the beauty of discipleship, tonight we focus upon the splendor of the Word of God and its centrality in our Christian lives. And on your behalf, I'm very pleased to welcome our two presenters, Bishop Murray Chatlin from the Diocese of Mackenzie Fort Smith. I had the great privilege, blessing, really, of attending his Episcopal ordination in Yellowknife. And at one point in the liturgy, he stood up and he spoke spontaneously to his people in Dene, without any notes. And I said, I'm, I'm witnessing a real shepherd, one who truly desires to be one with his people. So Bishop Murray, it's a delight to have you with us here this evening. Thank you. And Sister Eileen Schuller, native of Edmonton, local girl done really, really well, an internationally renowned scholar on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and one of my former professors. In fact, probably one of the best professors, sorry for embarrassing you, but probably one of the best professors I've ever had, with this uncanny ability to call on students in class for answers on the very day that they were not prepared. <laughs> you may be guessing that I learned that the hard way. <laughs> Sister Eileen, welcome home. Wonderful to have you. Let's now stand and pray together our nothing more beautiful prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you in praise and thanksgiving, for you have called us to be your own. You gave us your word to bring us truth and your spirit to make us full. Through them, we come to know the beauty that is you. Draw us to a new encounter with Jesus, your son. Deepen our love for his church. Help us to embrace in you the beauty of our faith in all of its richness. Empower us to see there is nothing more beautiful than our relationship with you so that we may reflect to others your image in which we have been created. We pray that rooted and grounded in your love and through the healing power of the cross of your Son, we may be strengthened for mission by your Holy Spirit. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Good evening to you all. And a special happy birthday to Karen, too, wherever she just disappeared there. Since I will be uh, speaking about the centrality of sacred scripture in the life of the disciple, I wanted to start with a joke uh, that includes scripture references. So as uh, Archbishop McNeil would say, about 900 years ago, when Archbishop Smith was an enthusiastic young priest, he was visiting door to door in his parish. And he came to this one door and he rang the bell and he could hear somebody moving around inside the house but they didn't answer the door. And so he took out his card and he wrote on the back of it, Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. I know you all know that but I'll say what the verse is for there. <laughs> Behold, I'm at the door knocking. <laughs> so he put the card in the... Uh, a mailbox, and he went on to some other parishioners. So lo and behold, the next Sunday, in the collection box, is his card. And underneath his writing was written, Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. I know you know this one as well, but it says, I was naked, so I hid. All discipleship begins with listening. We're in the season of Advent when we pay particular attention 
to the special discipleship of Mother Mary. One of our retreat masters, Father Tony Gittens, invited us to look at artist depictions of Mary's Annunciation. Several of the artists would point out Gabriel's angelic state by having rays of light emanate from him. And some of the artists will have one of these rays of light go from Gabriel to Mary's ear. The symbol that the real Annunciation, her discipleship starts by her hearing this word of God. And any disciple, it starts with listening, with hearing, that call by God. God incredibly speaks to each of us. For many of us, we have been able to listen best through the gift of sacred scripture. Listening to God and his word sounds pretty simple, but all of us know how challenging it is to be a really good listener. I believe it starts with silence. This is one of the major gifts I have received in being in the north, in the Dene world. People do not knock when they come to the door of someone's house. Probably this stems from the futility of trying to make a sound by tapping on the wall of a tent or a teepee or igloo. In the Dene world, you don't knock or ring the bell. You simply open the front door and step into the porch and wait there. You wait for a bit, you cough, something like that, make a little noise. And if no one comes to the porch, then you come back another time. And if someone is knocking, they know it's the RCMP or a nurse, not someone from the community. <laughs> Many a time in my rectory, called the Yatiquin, the priest's house, I'd have some music on, and finally I'd hear a <coughs> from the porch area. It made me spend more of my day with no TV or music on. I grew comfortable with the silence to the point where the furnace fan or the fridge running was noticeable. Something about this silence did something to the silence within me. I noticed that I could sit still more easily, that I was more attentive to things and people and even myself. The biggest benefit was that God seemed a little louder. Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, where there is silence, there is prayer. Where there is prayer, there is faith. Where there is faith, there is love. And where there is love, there is God. But it all begins with silence. In order to follow someone and not lose them, we have to keep hearing and seeing where they are. Maybe each of us can increase a little the silence in our own lives. Silence can help us to see and hear God more consistently. Discipleship and listening are also connected to how we normally communicate with each other. I have somewhat learned from the Dene how not to fill all the quiet moments with words. Have you ever been talking with someone and you cannot get a word in? Being a football fan, I have to admit a Saskatchewan Rough Rider fan. I, uh, I often want to do the time out sign when somebody's talking in a monologue really fast. Just to kind of get the balance of the conversation back. I wonder if that's how God feels sometimes with my prayers and conversations with him. The Dene, the Inuit, and often the Cree have much more silences in their communication than we are comfortable with. I'll give you a couple examples. I was in Campsell Portage, a small community in northern Saskatchewan, for a funeral. The body was being waked in the little mission church there. At about 10 in the morning, I was alone there when another young man joined me to sit with the body of a relative of his. We sat together for about an hour and talked for maybe five minutes during that time. After the funeral, we were visiting as a group and someone mentioned a fellow nicknamed Gilligan. And so I asked, who is Gilligan? And the young man who had been vigiling with me spoke up and said, 
don't you know my name? We visited together for an hour. It was clear to me in his mind our visiting was much more than the few words we spoke to each other. It was simply the time of being together. Many of you have served on pastoral councils. Sometimes those meetings can be good, sometimes a little painful. But in my experience, our pastoral council meetings are always full with many words. This was not the case in the pastoral council meetings in the Denny community of Fond du Lac. I would present an issue that we needed to discuss, and the group would talk about it in Dene for a few minutes. Then there was often a period of complete silence. I'm not talking about 30 seconds. Three or four minutes would go by as a group of 10 or 12 people would be sitting there. In my impatience, I would say, shall I go on to the next item? Not yet, Father, they would respond. A little more time would go by, then some more discussion would happen. And then they'd say, okay, what is the next item? I cannot tell you how much it went against my expectations of how a meeting should be run. Slowly, I continue to learn that visiting or discussions do not have to be filled with words. My poor parents often take the brunt of my cultural struggles. Remember one time they picked me up at the airport after I'd been in the north for a lengthy stint. In their good spirit of hospitality, they tried to catch me up on all the latest news. After about 20 minutes, I remember my rudely saying to them, do you two always talk this much? (laughs) They looked at each other somewhat puzzled and, uh, but to me, the rapid words felt like the staccato of a machine gun. I'd gotten used to more silence in the conversation. Now, do not let me mislead you. Some Dene are downright chatty. In fact, a nickname for a couple of the Dene people I know is Beyayati, which means radio. <laughs> if they're around, you don't need to turn on the radio. But as disciples, perhaps we can approach others and God with a few less words, recognizing that communication happens in many ways. Little morsels of scripture can be powerful. In my experience, God is rarely chatty. I now ask you to remember a a scripture passage that has been powerful for you. In the Aboriginal world, when you have fasted or prayed in a particular place, you often take a rock or a branch from that area and keep it in your room back home. In the course of the year, especially when you may be struggling, you look at or pick up the rock or branch and reconnect yourself with the graces you were blessed with during that prayer time. I think special passages from Scripture should be like that for us as well. They are beautiful in that the passage has the power to shift us from a place of anxiety and self-absorption to a place of peace and trust. The power also lasts in that years later we can recollect that passage and still be touched by the grace of that encounter with God years ago. One example from my own spiritual journey was back when I was in the seminary. I was always a reluctant vocation. I desired to be a good Christian, but I was not very eager to be a priest. I appreciated being at the seminary and the tremendous gift of studying theology, but I was really hoping to have a wife and family. My wrestling with God came to a head in the second year theology. I was arguing with God that if I became a priest, I would become lonely and bitter, and so I wouldn't be able to help anyone. I remember that prayer time and reading from the first chapter of the book of James. And when I read the line, you will lack nothing, it just had that power to convict me and stay with me that only God's word possesses. For me, it was a promise from God that any time I freely choose to respond to his call, 
I will lack nothing that I truly need. Certainly, I will not lack love, certainly not significant relationships. I would now ask you to take a moment to think of a significant passage of Scripture in your journey of discipleship. Maybe from your wedding or significant funeral. It may be from the lyrics of one of your favorite hymns. Whatever phrase or line has had the power of God's word for you. So like picking up that branch or stone, I invite you now just to think of that phrase in Scripture and just to let that grace of God be with you. We're going to practice taking a moment of silence. Now don't get too uncomfortable. Take a little moment to reflect on a powerful word of Scripture for us. This may offend some of the liturgists, but the most important book I carry with me is the little missalette living with Christ. I take a perverse pleasure in how dog-eared and well-traveled each month's edition is by the end of the month. Canoeing, hunting, and snowmobiling trips have not been easy on my body, my breviary, or my little missalettes. Each morning, I need to begin with some quiet time, preferably before the Blessed Sacrament, And very often I look with real anticipation to discover what is Jesus doing today in the gospel? Who is he talking with? How is he relating with his Father and the people? It is a richness that I know many of you share with me. And turning to his disciples, Jesus said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I say to you that many prophets and kings wish to see the things you see, and did not see them, to hear the things which you hear and did not hear them. Luke 10, 24. For me, reading the gospel of the day is a chance to watch and hear someone I love. The gospel seems to stay fresh for me, and although my prayer is often dry, it still offers me new insights and glimpses into the person of my Savior. If you are looking for more from your prayer life, and if you get a chance to go on a retreat, I really recommend trying St. Ignatius Loyola's style of prayer. Ignatius reminds us that our imagination is a gift from God and is one of the key ways that we communicate. If I want to tell Archbishop Smith about the Oilers hockey game the other night, I have to imagine in my mind the play that Eberly made And uh, as I'm imagining it, I speak the words, and Archbishop Smith has to imagine in his mind what it looked like in order for us to communicate about the actual play. So in our own communication, God has made us that we use our imaginations to really communicate about basic things. The same is true with our scriptures readings as well and the images that can come to us. God chooses to use our imaginations in our prayer. Sometimes God will speak to us in our dreams as our Aboriginal brothers and sisters are well aware. In this style of prayer, it begins by our quieting ourselves before the Lord in whatever way works well for you. Then we take a gospel scene and read through it. We pray to be open to God's inspiration and we seek to use our five senses to really be present in the scene with Jesus. Asking for God's help, we choose to be one of the characters that are present in the scene. Try not to rush choosing which character you should be. Instead, try to be inspired by the Spirit. You may find yourself as the blind man being healed, or as one of the disciples, or a vendor selling falafel on the road or even as one of the Pharisees or scribes. 
then you simply try to be in the scene as it unfolds. Try to hear what it sounds like, to smell the aromas, to feel the sun on you or the crowd pushing in around you. And you let the scene unfold around you, always asking to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Like a golf swing, it seems kind of strange at first, but if you keep trying it, you'll get the hang of it. The benefits of this form of praying, a form of praying, is that it engages us at many levels, and we end up having an openness that is not always there in our prayer. The scriptures can come alive, and we can have a richer sense that these are real people, many of whom we are still in relationship with as being part of the communion of saints. This prayer can be particularly fruitful when the people in the scene begin to interact with us. Again, we pray that these encounters are inspired by God. I will share an example. Several years ago, I was privileged to be able to take a 30-day Ignatian retreat at Guelph, Ontario. There was a lot of silence and not too many words for 30 days. As I became accustomed to this style of prayerful imagining, I found it very rewarding. In one prayer time, I was meditating on the birth of Jesus in the manger, kind of appropriate for this time of year. In my prayer, it seemed right that I would imagine myself as the stable boy in the manger who was helping to look after the animals. I really felt that I was with Mary and her newborn. I asked if there was anything I could help with. And in my imagining of my prayer, Mary said to me, Murray, it is just good to have you around. Well, this is not a line you will find in the Bible anywhere or in a biblical concordance. It was giving to me while I was praying with scripture. And whenever I feel like I've disappointed someone or I'm not doing enough, I just remember Mary speaking to me, Murray, it's just good to have you around. And it has that power still to put my mind and heart in the right place again. My relationship with Mary has been so much more real and significant since that prayer time. There are many ways to pray. I just offer this as one of the gifts of our rich Catholic spiritual tradition that you may want to try your own prayer life. With discipleship, I think something that we have to remember again and again is, who has the power? One of our priests in the north will often say, the first five years of my priesthood, I thought I was Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) The next five years, I thought it was Jesus and I working together. After that, I finally realized Jesus is the one scoring all the goals. I just hope to get the odd assist. It is so important for us to keep recognizing where the real power comes from. As I mentioned before, for the last several years, I have lived out my discipleship among the Dene and Inuit of our vast north. It has been a challenging time, but also full of adventure and highly touching and rewarding. As God promised, I continue to lack nothing of real importance. Though good fresh fruit and vegetables are difficult to come by in Taktoyaktak or Delaney. Living in a different culture and studying a different language helps me to look at our scripture with different eyes. We are called as disciples to proclaim that the kingdom of God is near. When trying to translate the gospel to speak to the people of our northern communities, It makes me really consider what the initial stories are saying and how it can make sense in Fort Resolution or Tsigachik in this day today. The initial translation of the sacred scriptures into languages which evolved on our northern tundra must have been daunting. One example I often refer to is how the word lamb was translated in the Cree language. During the Mass, I was struck by the translation in the Lamb of God prayer. Puzzled, I mentioned it to an elder that the word lamb was translated in in kind of an odd way, it seemed to me. The elder said, yes, 
it means little ugly caribou. <laughs> when I hold up the host and say little ugly caribou, it's, <laughs> it gives you a sense of how hard it is to translate from one culture to another. It begins to show the enormity of translating animals and farming practices, let alone Jewish religious context, into a local language. Yet our love for the scripture means we make the effort to make these translations. And that the cultural wrestling is not only worth it, but incredibly, can the scriptures continue to bring a power to all listeners, whatever culture or language. Another critical element of discipleship is recognizing that we have not been abandoned to our own devices. Jesus has sent us the advocate who always pleads our cause. Do we really trust the Holy Spirit? Will the Son of Man find any faith? I've always liked the story of the fellow who was looking over the edge of a cliff when all of a sudden the ground crumbled and he started sliding over the edge. The last second he was able to grab onto the root of a tree and found himself hanging in midair with nothing but rocks thousand feet below and the top of the cliff above him, too high to climb back up. Recognizing his predicament, he yelled for help. A voice from above said, what do you need? And he replied, I need help to get back up on the top of the cliff. The voice said, very well. I am God. Just let go of the root, and I will send a wind that will lift you up and carry you back to the top of the cliff. The fellow looked up for a bit, looked down for a long while, looked up again and said, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> that is so us, or at least so me. My faith is little, especially when a storm is beginning to brew. The waves do not have to get very high at all, and I'm panicking way before St. Peter did. How do we strengthen our faith? I think it is by sharing our, our, our faith stories, those of the Bible and those of our own lives, the living scriptures. I was recently visiting a couple, and the husband is dying of cancer. I asked them if they trusted that Jesus was with them at this time. The wife paused and then she told me a story about what happened years ago. Her husband was away at that time and she was alone with her young children in the evening. She was getting ready for bed and there was a strong sense that she should lock the front door of her house. She said, we never lock the front door. And yet there's just this strong sense to lock the door. And she said, we didn't even have a lock for the door. She said, I went into the kitchen and I got a big butcher knife and I stuck it in the door jam to keep the door, uh, door closed. And she says, sure enough, I woke up at 1 a.m. in the morning and someone was trying to break into the house. I teased her, I said. You gave him a weapon right by the door. <laughs> and she laughed and she said, there was no window for him to break in and grab the knife. But then she became serious and said, I have so often looked back on that night and realized that I'm not alone, that he is looking out for us. At least a part of me knows that that's also true now when my husband is so sick. We are called to be living scriptures for each other. The power, any real power, always comes from God. I'm reminded of this any time I give a talk or a homily, tonight included. As St. Paul says, I can have all the eloquence of people, but if the love of God is not active in my words, then it will mean nothing at all. So often I've given a well-prepared talk and it has done little. Often I've given a homily that I do not think much of, and it has had power. I remember one lady coming up to me and saying, Bishop, that homily was one of the best I've ever heard. 
I thought I'd better find out what it was I said that really moved her so I could say it again and again and again. So I asked her, what was it that you heard? And I had to smile when she said the words back because I know I didn't say those words. <laughs> Lord, help our lack of faith. So my prayer tonight is that all of our Bibles and missalettes may become a little more dog-eared. That by having a little more silence and using a few less words, we may become better listeners. That in our listening, we may find the words and deeds that challenge and model for us our call to discipleship. May we continue to draw from Ignatian spirituality and other elements of our rich tradition. May we be always aware of where the true power comes from, and may we be stronger in our trust and faith in the presence of that power. Thank you, Lord, for your gift of sacred scripture, and thank you, Lord, for calling each of us to follow you. God bless you.
I still don't quite believe that I'm standing here in Edmonton, in this cathedral, to give this talk. When Archbishop Smith first wrote to ask me if I would do a presentation in the Nothing More Beautiful series, he anticipated that I might decline, claiming that I was too busy to take this on. I replied by return mail that I would not say no for that reason, because I was too busy, but that my immediate response was definitely negative. I'm probably the least obvious person to be invited for an evening like this. My life has been quite ordinary and uneventful. I've always been a teacher, though probably one of the few sisters who has never taught elementary school or even high school. I teach now at McMaster University in Hamilton, a typical large secular research university. And some of you are probably already conjuring up some of the usual stereotypes of university professors. Hard to understand, dull, isolated from the real world, a bit eccentric. And even worse is that within the university, I don't work on the cutting edge of modern physics or on medical research that's going to save lives or even on some trendy postmodern theory. I teach the Bible and other ancient texts. I read dead languages. I try to make sense out of little bits of writings that have survived from antiquity. I'm quite used to giving lectures, but to give a witness talk. When I mentioned the invitation to a few friends who know me, including some of my own sisters, they just laughed. I mean, I'm one of those people who shuts down, literally goes blank when I'm asked to share how some poem is speaking to me or my favorite animal or color, and much less an account of what God is doing in my life. So why am I here? Why did I say yes in the end? For at least three reasons, and there's probably some more lurking beneath the surface. First of all, because the topic tonight is scripture. I have been privileged to study and to teach the Bible, its world and its languages for over 40 years. And for me, it has been through this study and teaching that I have learned something of the truth of the words of Pope Benedict that have inspired this series, that there is nothing more beautiful than to know him and to speak out to others of our friendship with him. I've been engaged in Bible study in a wide variety of contexts. As a student, I took my first course from Archbishop Gervais but I've also studied with rabbis in Jerusalem in classes with all Jewish students. I've got an insight into the meaning of a biblical word or phrase by studying Akkadian and Ugaritic. But I've also learned from hearing ordinary folks in a parish Bible study talk about how they read that verse. As a teacher, I have taught in a seminary and theological college where we all shared a common understanding that the Bible was the Word of God, a sacred and authoritative text, a rule of faith and conduct. Now I teach in a secular and academic context where the Bible competes with the Quran and the Bhagavad Gita and where often even the most basic biblical narrative, its stories and its names are virtually unknown or are being read for the first time. Yet in each context, in its own way, 
I have come to be surprised by the gospel, to use Pope Benedict's words again. Secondly, I said yes to, to tonight because I thought that perhaps in some very small measure, this might be my way of saying thank you to the church in Edmonton that nurtured me in the first stages of my journey of faith. I think tonight of Assumption Parish, St. Joseph Seminary, Newman Theological College, St. Joseph's College, so many individual friends, relatives, teachers, pastors who are in my thoughts this evening, though they cannot be named here. And finally, and not least, I said yes because Richard, because Archbishop Smith asked me. <laughs> there is a bond between teacher and student, and it's real and tangible and enduring. Many years ago, I made a commitment to myself to respond positively whenever I could to a request from a former student. And I've often been invited to break open the words of our shared scriptures in united Anglican, Baptist, non-denominational churches across the country where my students are currently ministering. And now I join you here this evening in this beautiful cathedral setting to tell you something of my life and my faith journey because a former student asked me. I was born only a few blocks from here in the General Hospital and grew up for a few years in Rimby. I don't know if there's anybody here from Rimby, Pinocchio, Lacombe. Yes. <laughs> then my parents moved to Edmonton to the Bonnie Dune area. I'm the oldest of four girls. Three of us, Teresa, Linda, and I were so close in age that we were sometimes taken for triplets. There's another sister, Rita, and my brother, Dennis. My mother taught for years at St. Helen's School. My father was a construction worker. For many years, Dad did the repairs and renovations for many rectories and convents throughout the city. We belonged to Assumption Parish. It was there that I came to learn and love the liturgy, especially when I played the organ, as I did not particularly well, but consistently, week after week, for Mass and Sunday night benediction. I did my elementary school at St. Thomas Aquinas, my high school at St. Mary's. And there I met the Ursuline sisters, who had come to Edmonton some years previously from Ontario, particularly our principal, Mother Mary Janet of Blessed Memory. There's only been a small number of Ursulines in Edmonton from our community. Probably many of you are more familiar with the Ursulines of Jesus. As we used to say jokingly, we're just the Ursulines of Chatham. <laughs> but a year after I finished high school, I entered the Ursuline novitiate in Chatham. Though I did receive my postulant dress and veil in a little ceremony in the Edmonton convent so that I could travel at half price on the train. Now, even today, there's so much that I cannot explain about that decision. And it's perhaps explanation is not what is needed. I mean, how many people try to explain their choice to marry a particular person? 1964, when I entered, was in the middle of the Vatican Council. The novitiate experience was strict, traditional, and yet change was in the air. We received the long black habit, but we knew that we would wear it for less than a year. Over 40 young women entered in those years. Two of us are in the community today. I still don't know what that all means. But I think that those of us who lived through those tumultuous Vatican II and post-Vatican II years in religious life, 
had a unique experience. It was a very different experience than that of young people today. But I do think it's one that needs to be named and remembered. I made my final profession at Assumption Church on a bitterly cold January day in 1975. And that is the day that I still celebrate, the moment when I really said my yes to a call that still remains so much a mystery. Perhaps some of you know this quotation from the German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer in a homily that he gave to a young couple on their wedding day. He told them, from this day forth, it is not your love that sustains your marriage, but from now on, it is the marriage that sustains your love. And that's what I experienced. It was the public profession of my religious vows. The church gathered as witnesses on that day that has sustained my vocation. That January morning, we sang the L'Arche hymn. I fear in the dark and the doubt of my journey, but courage will come with the sound of your step by my side. And courage has come day by day, even as I continue to pray for perseverance. The Second Vatican Council called upon each religious community to rediscover their special charism. That is, what was the special gift of the Spirit given to their founder for the service of the Church? St. Angela Merici began the Ursulines in 1535 as a company of women who would undertake lives of evangelical holiness and total dedication in the midst of society. At a time when the cloister was considered the only possible milieu for a consecrated life, she had a vision of women giving a different type of witness in and to the world. Sometime during my novitiate, I came upon a short quotation from Cardinal Suhard, the Archbishop of Paris during the war years, a quotation that I still have on my desk. To be a witness does not consist in engaging in propaganda or even in stirring people up, but in being a living mystery. It means to live in such a way that one's life would not make sense if God did not exist. These words spoke to my young heart, and I experienced them as a call. Could there not be a witness to young people, to students, in a complex university environment, like the University of Alberta? Might this be the type of milieu where St. Angela would want her daughters to live and work? Well, when I told my profound insight to our superior general, let's just say she didn't see things in quite the same way. <laughs> Nuns go to teacher's college, or at very least to a Catholic institution. Universities were secular, dangerous places, yet I want to reconsider my vocation. I continued to think long and hard about what it might mean to be a living witness in places where the church and religion has no public presence, indeed is highly suspect. And God works in strange ways. A few months later, Mother St. David went to a meeting in Ontario for religious superiors who were opening new missions in South America, as our community and many others did in Peru in the 1960s. And there she was told that it was the mind of the church, I still remember her using that expression, that young religious from distant lands should be educated in their own culture. 
To her, Alberta was just about as foreign as Peru. <laughs> so I ended up at the University of Alberta. I took a classics degree and fell in love with Greek and Latin and the ancient world. In those years, the only way to take Hebrew was at St. Stephen's College, where the course was cross-listed both as a U of A undergraduate course and for the United Church Ministry. So somewhere in the recesses of the United Church archives, I have a credit stored away. I'm not going to go through a chronology of my life. Suffice it to say, I went back and forth for a number of years. I taught at St. Joseph's Seminary, Newman Theological College, St. Joseph's College. I worked for the liturgy office for the diocese. And I was studying at Toronto. And then I went to Harvard and did my doctorate there. On the completion of my studies, I ended up quite unexpectedly in Halifax. The Ursulines had never been in the Maritimes, and I remain forever grateful to the Sisters of Charity of Halifax, who adopted me and gave me a home there. And for eight very rich and challenging years, I taught Old Testament in Hebrew at Atlantic School of Theology. Now, I'm sure many of you already know something about Atlantic School of Theology, AST, since your Archbishop is an alumnus. In 1971, the United Church Pine Hill Divinity Hall, the Anglican King's College, and Holy Heart Catholic Seminary had come together to form a single theological school that would prepare clergy and lay leaders for all three churches. Archbishop Hayes provided much of the vision for this truly unique and daring ecumenical venture. And for me, those years were a transformative experience. When I grew up, Catholics and Protestants still lived in separate worlds. When I was in my early teens, for instance, I was asked to play the piano for a weekly meeting of the Brownies at the United Church on our corner. I still remember, I only had to know how to play God Save the Queen and the March of the Teddy Bears. <laughs> but this required a trip to the Assumption Rectory and consultation with no less than Monsignor. I mean, this wasn't a matter for the assistant priest with whom my family usually dealt. And with all the wisdom of Solomon, Monsignor agreed that Christian charity would allow me to help out these United Church Brownies as long as I didn't say the Our Father with them, since, you know, they add things on at the end. <laughs> and now, within a relatively few years, I was teaching Protestants, praying with them on a daily basis, and learning with and from them. The image that's often used in ecumenical circles is that of a gift exchange, where each participant brings and receives a gift. And that's what I experienced at AST. In terms of scripture, since that's our topic here this evening, one of the gifts that I received was an appreciation of Bible study as a religious devotion. Now, a Bible study might be long or short. At times, it might be insightful. At times, simply dull and mundane. But what I saw was what it means to turn to the Bible, to take up the Bible and read it and talk about it. At the start of virtually every activity, meeting, class, before a picnic, at the sickbed, on every occasion. And I was able to bring a gift, I hope, from my Catholic tradition. The sense of reading the Bible within a long tradition that is shaped by the lectionary. A sense of the givenness of what we read in scripture. That we read on a particular Sunday in communion with listeners around the world who are hearing the same word of the Lord. 
In January 1990, I began a new position at St. McMaster University in the Religious Studies Department. Over that Christmas break, not only did I travel geographically from Halifax to Hamilton, but I went from hearing myself being called Sister Eileen to becoming Dr. Schuler. And I had to learn, and believe me, I'm still learning, how to witness to the gospel now in this particular environment with all its demands and challenges. As a university professor, I'm paid to do research, teaching, and service. And I believe that my first obligation is to do all three of these parts of my job to the best of my ability. As the old saying goes, the Christian way to wash dishes is to get them clean. <laughs> but what else can I bring? Here I turn to the legacy of our founder, St. Angela, and I quote a passage that has meant a great deal to me. She wrote, Try to be kind always. Use all possible gentleness. Take each and every one into account, not just their names, but their background and character. You can see that human mothers, even if they had a thousand sons and daughters, would still find room for every single one in their hearts, because that is how true love works. And these are the words that challenge me daily then in the highly competitive, impersonal, the large numbers of students, faculty, and staff that we deal with in the university situation. Let me say just one word yet about my research. Because one of the things that has shaped my life most profoundly has been that when I was in graduate school around 1980, I was given the opportunity to work on the Dead Sea Scrolls. I suspect every one of you have heard something about the scrolls. They come up in the news, usually around Christmas and Easter, when the media is looking for something religious and also a bit sensational. But what we're really talking about is a vast collection of ancient manuscripts, most very damaged and fragmentary, that were discovered by chance 1947 to 1956, in caves by the shore of the Dead Sea. And this has been called, and I think rightly so, the greatest manuscript discovery of modern times. And these documents give us a whole new source of information about the world, and especially the Jewish world, at the time when Jesus lived. So for over 60 years, between 1948 and about 2008, when the project was finally completed, many scholars, Jews and Christians, were working on deciphering the little pieces of leather, trying to transcribe the Hebrew or Aramaic, translating the text, writing commentaries. And I was given the responsibility of preparing the first editions of various collections of prayers and psalms. And in these, we had a window into how Jews were actually praying at the time of Jesus. They continued to write new psalms beyond the 150 in our Bible, psalms of praise and thanksgiving in particular. In other texts that they, I worked on, we can see the first evidence of the beginning of the blessing formulas, Baruch Adonai, Blessed are you, O Lord, which we know now was being developed at the time of Jesus. And this language, this way of praying in terms of blessings, is distinctive of the Jewish Siddur, the prayer book today, and you'll recognize it in our Mass, in the prayer and the preparation of gifts. Blessed are you, O Lord, God of our, all creation. I've often been asked what it has been like for me to work on this material. 
Now these days there's actually much tighter control and there's a real concern about preservation. But in the 1980s when I began, we could spread out the tables, we could touch and handle the material, we could even try to make new joins in this vast jigsaw puzzle. And I was very aware that some of these pieces of leather were being tanned. The ink was mixed at the time when Jesus lived and walked on earth. And I think in that way, something of the mystery of the incarnation became very real to me. That to be human means that Jesus lived in a particular time and place as a member of the Jewish people. But there is another side of research, and one that I've struggled with all my life. Scholarship takes long hours, often working in isolation, writing an article that mainly, maybe only a few dozen other people will read, but hopefully somebody can build on to achieve just a little better understanding of a difficult text. What is the justification when there are people to be fed, the poor to be cared for, when there's a need for structural and societal change? I take heart from the fact that our Catholic tradition has always valued and found a place for the intellectual life. Ever since the encyclical in 1943, Divino Flanti Spirit, the popes have called for the study of the ancient world, recognizing the need, and I quote here Pius XII, for the study of history, archaeology, ethnology, and other sciences to help us read the Bible. And I'm convinced that this tradition must not be lost, even as more recently there have been calls for a more spiritual, theological reading of scripture and a renewed sense of the patristic heritage. And I do believe that I have learned something about the search for God precisely through my studies. As a Dominican scholar, Simon Tugwell once put it, the discipline of fidelity to God is essentially like the discipline of scholarship. Both involve a patient and humble readiness to face the evidence. And so since we are reflecting tonight on scripture and discipleship, I want to close by leaving you with three passages to think about. Now perhaps these might seem a bit unusual, even idiosyncratic choices, but each has been meaningful to me as I struggle with my own call, acutely aware of my limitations and where I have fallen short, but increasingly aware of the depth and the hiddenness of the divine mystery that's beyond all human activity and knowledge. And perhaps just one of these texts or figures will elicit some response in you or shed a little bit of light on something in your own life. So first, and fittingly in this Advent season, I want to call to mind the three wise men. And I'm going to quote from a British novelist, E. Wow. Some of you might, have known him, might know him more from his famous work, Brideside Revisited. But Wow wrote a short novel about St. Helena, the mother of Constantine in our tradition, the discoverer of the true cross. And Helena had been part of the turmoil and the chaos of the late Roman Empire, of the search for truth in the world at that time. And in the passage I'm going to read, she makes a comparison between the wise men and their long journey and the more simple, spontaneous response of the shepherds. She addresses the wise men. You were late in coming. The shepherds were here long before. Even the cattle got here. How laboriously you came, taking in the sights and calculating, where the shepherds just ran barefoot. 
How odd you looked on the road, laden with such preposterous gifts. Yet you came and you were not turned away. You too found room before the manger. You are the patron of all latecomers, of all who have to make a tedious journey to the truth, of all who can be confused with knowledge and speculation, of all who stand in danger by reason of their talents. For the sake of the one who did not reject your curious gifts, pray always for the learned. Let them not be quite forgotten at the throne of God when the simple come into the kingdom. The wise men and the shepherds, such different models of discipleship. Yet both are needed in our world and in our church and both found a place at the manger. The second passage that has been a great source of consolation to me is from the Gospel of Mark, just before the Passion narrative, chapter 14. We have here a story that's told in different ways in each of the Gospels. If I get started exegeting it, we could spend all evening here, but I'll refrain. But in Mark's Gospel, Jesus is in the house of Simon in Bethany when a woman enters with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment. She comes to Jesus and anoints his feet. When she's criticized for not giving money to the poor, Jesus defends her saying, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. She has done what she could. The text does not say she has done everything. She has done all that is needs to be done. She has done what others are doing. Only she has done what she could. And finally, in this Advent season, I want to close with a verse from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 15. Truly you are a God who hides yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. A God who hides yourself. Advent is the season of light, of, of light and of revelation. We contemplate the disclosure of God's love in the infant child. And we profess that the one whom the prophets announced has indeed come, is visible, is known in time and history. But we also remember that the God whom we come to know in Christ Jesus remains the God of mystery, unfathomable depth, the hidden God who dwells in unapproachable light until that day we meet face to face. And so I conclude this evening with words from St. Thomas Aquinas to pray for all of us individually and communally. Grant us, O Lord, a mind to know you, a heart to seek you, wisdom to find you, conduct pleasing to you, faithful perseverance in waiting for you, and the hope of finding, finally embracing you. Amen. And thank you.
at the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to sing. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All-powerful God, help us to look forward in hope the coming of our Savior. May we live as he has taught, ready to welcome him with burning love and faith. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We've had the joy this evening of reflecting upon the splendor of God's Word, central to the life of every Christian. And I'm deeply grateful to Sister Eileen, to Bishop Murray, for your presentations tonight. You've reminded us that God's Word is a living Word, not simply to be read, but to be encountered. Something that engages us, transforms us, speaks to us and draws us into that communion of love that God wills to have with each of his children. It's clear from your witness that you have allowed God's word to engage and transform you. And we're very grateful that you have shared something of that witness with us here this evening. Thank you so much. smile upon you. Amen, amen. May the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, grant you peace. Amen, amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. <laughs> 